Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ryan McGee, and um, once he gets mic'd up, he'll uh, lead us on an adventure. Thank you. So I'm actually a grad student, so I'm working on that doctor, but uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be able to be here today. I'd like to really thank the organizers for putting this on and um, letting me have a chance to talk to you all. Um, so today I'm going to be uh, starting this perspective session by talking about natural selection as a learning process that acquires information. And I thought I'd talk about this uh, project area because it also gives a nice survey of evolutionary perspectives along the way. And to start, I'd like to give a sketch of an evolutionary framework that I use to motivate a lot of my questions in this area. So let's consider an organism that has some phenotype and that faces some environmental state that perhaps changes over time as the result of some stochastic or dynamical process. And this phenotype of the organism itself is a product of its genotype and some internal state. And this internal state you can think of as a gene regulatory state, a neural state, behavioral state, or what have you. And this internal state is a product of some sensory integration process. So like Eric touched on earlier today, maybe a signal transduction cascade, maybe a neuronal circuit, something like that, that's encoding something about the environment internally. And then the organism has some fitness that's a function of its phenotype and it's matching to the environmental state. And of course, this dictates how many organisms this uh, particular organism will contribute to the next generation. And it also contributes its genotype to the next generation, which may mutate in the process. And the cycle continues and we have natural selection acting in this system. So then given that the fitness function is a, is a function of the matching between phenotype and environment, it would seem that if the organism had access to some information about the environmental state in adopting this phenotype, that, that could have a fitness benefit for the organism. And this is something that a lot of people have looked at, including uh, several people in this room, looking at what is the effect of information being provided to an organism or lineage? What is the impact of that on the long-term fitness success of that population or lineage? And there's some good theory out there that suggests that for every bit of information you acquire about the environment, you get some proportional fold increase in the long-term fitness of the population or lineage. And I'm glossing over a little bit exactly the definition of this information, but in general you can think of it as a mutual information between the environment and something internal to the organism. And the details depend on the model you're exactly looking at. So then if we return here, we can ask how exactly would an organism get information about the environment in this way? So one channel is a sensory integration channel whereby interfacing with the physics or chemistry of the environmental state, the organism encodes something um, in its internal components. It's one way to get information about the environment. Another is this channel of genetic material that gets passed from one generation to the next. So through the interfacing of phenotype and environment, there's some uh, change in the genotypic distribution of the population, and that change in distribution of genotypes can also encode some information about the environment. And so this is the, the information channel I'm going to be talking about today. And what I'm interested in is understanding how natural selection acts as a process that builds up information in this channel. So to start, um, I'm going to introduce what I mean by in information gain in this context with an example. So suppose I flip a coin and I catch it and I hide the state from you, but I ask you to guess what the state of the coin is. The coin could be either heads or tails, and at this point you have some prior hypothesis about the state of the coin, which you can uh, represent as some distribution over the possible states. And then suppose I take a peek at the coin and I tell you that the coin is heads, but you haven't seen it. Given this, you might update your hypothesis to the extent that you believe me to not be a liar. And one possible way you might update hypothesis a hypothesis, maybe not what you're going to do in your head, but maybe if you had a computer or something, you could use Bayesian updating where you could reweight your hypotheses given the evidence that you've received. And then the question is, how much information did you gain by this piece of evidence that I gave you about the coin? And we can measure that as the change in your hypothesis before and after the evidence was given using the KL divergence of your posterior and prior hypotheses. And in this example, if you were to run the numbers, which I'm glossing over the calculation, but you're probably familiar with it, you would get one bit of information if you change your hypotheses in this way. So in the context of natural selection, we can think of a genotype as representing a hypothesis about the environment. 
So for example, an allele that encodes light fur coloration, we can think about it as a hypothesis that the environment is one where light fur coloration has high fitness. Or an allele that, has, that encodes dark coloration could be seen as a hypothesis that the environment is dark. And at the population level, we have many individuals with many genotypes, or each with their own genotypes. And the population's distribution of genotypes can be thought of as the population's hypothesis about what the environment really is. Natural selection will update the frequencies of these genotypes based on their fitnesses. And you can think of this as, a, as natural selection gaining evidence about what the environment state really is. We can model how the frequencies of genotypes changes over time using the well-known replicator dynamic, which is a model of uh, kind of pure unadulterated selection acting. And as Mark Harper, who's uh, with us, has pointed out, as well as others, is that um, the replicator dynamic and Bayesian updating are formally analogous to each other. So you can see that the replicator dynamic reweights uh, the frequencies of genotypes by weighting them by uh, fitness, which is serving the same role as the evidence provided in Bayesian updating. So in general, we can think about natural selection as analogous to some Bayesian learning process. And then again, we can ask how much information does the population gain by this update process? And we can measure that the same way as before by measuring the divergence of the posterior and prior distributions. Okay. So we can uh, track the allele frequencies over time as selection proceeds, and we can measure the information gain over time as well. And as the population nears some equilibrium composition, it is gaining as much information as it can from the environment given its uh, basin on the fitness landscape. But we might want to look more mechanistically at exactly what causes these allele frequencies to change, which is, of course, different reproductive success between organisms. So in this example, this might be a predator that picks off darkly colored types more often in a lightly colored environment due to differences in camouflage. And so we have some selective deaths that as the allele frequencies change, this is driven by, in this case, a pile of dead mice that builds up over time. And so what natural selection gives us is allele frequency change that gives the population information about the environment, but a corresponding buildup of this pile of dead mice, the selective deaths, loss of potential growth of the population that builds up um, as well. We might want to ask, this seems like a perhaps cost of selection, and we might want to ask how this relates to the information we get out of selection. Well, population geneticists considered these kinds of costs a lot in the 1960s and onward. And in particular, Haldane and Kimura um, quantified exactly what we're talking about here. So what is the amount of uh, potential population growth that is lost by the action of selection acting in a population? And they termed this substitutional load. So we can take a look at exactly what they define as substitutional load, which is just the time integral of the difference between the fitness of the best type in the population minus the fitness of the average type in the population. We can also write this equivalently as the integral of the expected selection coefficient, but I think the first definition is a little bit more intuitive. And so we can illustrate this as, suppose there's a population that has a best type that has fitness uh, W max, and the fitness of the population overall is going to be increasing over time as we select for that type. And then this integral here is what we're talking about, a substitutional load. And as, a, as selection continues, eventually fixing the best type, the average fitness of the population reaches that level, and the load uh, in this case converges for the case of a gene substitution. OK, so here's another illustration just to drive home what we're talking about with load. So imagine we have two different types of bacteria. The blue type is sensitive to a drug. The red type is resistant. And if we had a population that was initially totally resistant, it might grow something like this. But if we have a population that has to go through selection in order to, quote unquote, learn that the red type is best for the environment, then we might see the population grow something like this, where you have some mortality in the, of the blue type. And then uh, substitutional load is measuring this fraction here of the potential population growth that is not realized because selection was acting on the population. And so in this case, we ran the numbers. We'd find that the substitutional load at this point is approaching 1. And the load is measured in terms of fold reductions in growth. So we have one two-fold re reduction in long-term growth, representing us missing half of our potential growth there. So we have a way of measuring information gain, and we also have a way of quantifying this cost. We might want to ask how these two things relate to each other. 
Kamira, who developed um, one of the people who developed the notion of substitutional load, pointed out in the 60s that the information gain and load are equal to each other at the time of fixation in a gene substitution. And I've worked out that you can prove pretty straightforwardly that the information gain is always exceeded by the load throughout the entire course of selection. So what this tells us is that for every bit of information gain that you want to get, you have to pay for that with at least a commensurate amount of load. So this seems to be a pretty fundamental relationship between information and fitness, um, which is, of course, two of the fundamental quantities of natural selection. Um, so we might want to you know, check a real population and see how this theory checks out. And we might expect that uh, a biological population to closely adhere to the theory where information gain and load converge on each other um, at equilibrium. Or we might find that biological details we haven't accounted for cause the load to exceed information gain by more than we expect. Or perhaps even more unexpectedly, we're missing something in our theory that would cause information gain to exceed load. And so I'll just talk really quickly, mentioning that um, we, uh, we've done experiments to test this where we can basically with different strains of E. coli, with different fitnesses, we can measure the allele frequency change and population growth over time, and we can track information gain and substitutional load in this case. And we find results like this, which in the interest of time I'll gloss over a little bit, but we find that the information gain and substitutional load adhere very closely to the theory. And we can do this replicated over many different population composition conditions, and we find that this uh, result holds quite well in general. So it seems that in order to get information by natural selection, there's this potential cost of information represented by this load that you have to pay. We might ask, can we do better than this? And so uh, natural selection, of course, is just an emergent process that happens to occur spontaneously in nature, but there are many other learning processes that we might use to acquire information. And so we can ask how natural selection compares to some uh, engineered or human-derived learning process if we start from scratch. And so we can turn to um, what is the problem that natural selection is actually addressing, and we can strip away some of the biological details to look at what a, a generic algorithm would do with a similar problem. And so we can model this problem as a game between two players, and our opponent, the yellow player, has some strategies and a mixed strategy distribution. They use to play strategies, and we have a mixed strategy distribution as well. And depending on what strategies we play, we will receive some loss, which you can think of as just the same as a payoff, but just the opposite. So we want to, instead of maximize our payoff, we want to minimize our loss. And each of our um, strategy pairs has some loss associated with it. And if we play this game with the environment over many rounds, we can calculate our average or expected loss over time. And we can also calculate our total expected loss over many rounds of the game. And our goal is to come up with a mixed strategy here that will minimize our total loss over many plays of the game. So we want to learn what is a good strategy against the environment player that we're facing, which is our opponent player. So if we go back to the drawing board, a heuristic we might use is to increase the weight of strategies that we play that have low loss in the past and vice versa. But we don't want to put all our eggs in one basket based on just the rounds we've seen, but rather we'd like to maintain some spread over strategies in order to um, hedge against things we haven't seen yet, and also maintain diversity that we can con continue to sample losses out there. So what we might want to do is choose a distribution that minimizes expected loss, as well as maintains spread over time. And we can formalize this as an optimization process and work out the update rule that corresponds to it. And we have that this is what's known as the multiplicative weights update algorithm, which is an algorithm that's been derived um, many times in computer science and learning theory, economics, and so on. And what's interesting about this is that this algorithm is guaranteed to find some uh, good strategy that achieves a, a total loss that is bounded um, and guarantees to be not much worse than the loss of the best strategy if you use the best strategy all along, plus some penalty of having to find that strategy, which is constant in time. So at the end of the day, we have an algorithm that is guaranteed to perform uh, essentially negligibly worse than using the best strategy all along. So we can update our strategy using this and receive a total loss that's equal to the optimal loss um, plus epsilon. And we can use this in the biological context now where our strategies are genotypes and our opponent is playing environmental states. And we want to ask, how would we use this to minimize our loss of fitness that we were talking about before? So really quickly, I will 
skip over some of the logic in the interest of time, but this loss function here is the negative log of fitness. If you use this as your loss function, you can show that this will maximize your long-term growth. So using this loss function and minimizing this will achieve a biological population's goal of maximizing its long-term growth. So if we take this loss function and plug it into this algorithm we just found that will minimize this loss, and then do some algebra to simplify this, we find this update rule, which you probably recognize as the replicator dynamic of natural selection. So what we have is that natural selection is in fact an instance of this algorithm that arrives at a loss optimal strategy distribution and the loss, the total loss is bounded to be uh, within epsilon over time of the optimal loss possible. And then I'll point out if we look a little bit closer what exactly we're quantifying is the total loss here. So if we plug in our loss function into the expression for total cumulative loss, we find that we're taking the integral of the expected selection coefficient, which of course is the definition of substitutional load from before, which I now reterm selection load to represent that this applies not just to substitutions, but to general cases of selection. And we also have this bound now on load that tells us the load is guaranteed, to be guaranteed using natural selection to be within epsilon of what is an optimal strategy. And this also points, the second term here, the penalty you might recognize as the information gain from the initial state to the equilibrium state. And this gives us a clue that I can also show that the information gain is guaranteed to be exceeded by load in these very general conditions. So we've assumed nothing about the environment, its distribution, how it chooses its distribution. It can in fact choose arbitrary distributions or even be adversarial in knowing what the population is doing. And in this way, this is a very general result. And you can construct games here that represent many different conditions, including uh, changing environments, heterogeneous environments, frequency dependence, and so on. So I'll skip over this, but you can recover Kamira's result as well from this more general result. And just to summarize, we have that selection acquires information. There's a minimum load for every bit of information that is acquired. This is general and experimentally validated for one case. And load is a measure of the efficiency of natural selection as a learning process. And in fact, selection achieves close to the minimal possible load. So this is not such a costly process after all. And I apologize for going a little bit long, but I'd like to thank everyone here for your attention as well as my collaborators. We'll go ahead and, and get started with the next speaker. And you guys can find Ryan at the break um, in uh, half an hour. Thank you very much, Ryan.